Uh, so my talk is about conversational computing, how Okasaki made McCarthy right once again. Now, uh, I would like to start off my talk with a little bit of, if it works, puzzle time. Does anybody here know this guy? <laughs> Check. Who is it? John McCarthy. Very good. So John McCarthy is the guy who coined the term artificial intelligence back in 1955. Uh, he went on to invent garbage collection, time sharing, and non-monotonic reasoning. And in 1960, he published what would become the theoretical foundation for half a century of computing. This paper, Recursive Functions of Symbolic Expressions in Their Computation by Machine, otherwise known as the LISP paper. Now, and this paper was groundbreaking, as we all know, because we're still using stuff that's inspired by this. But does anybody here also know what John McCarthy published in the year 1959? <laughs> Not exactly. In 1959, John McCarthy published this, Programs with Common Sense. And Programs with Common Sense is a paper in which he introduces the concept called the advice taker. Now, in John McCarthy's word, the advice taker was a proposed program for solving problems by manipulating sentences in formal languages. And uh, McCarthy expected that the main advantages of the advice taker would be uh, to make a system that is behavior, or whose behavior would be improvable merely by making statements to it, telling it about its symbolic environment and what is wanted from it. Now, uh, he wanted to achieve a system which could be told to make a specific improvement in its behavior with no more knowledge of its internal structure or previous knowledge than would be required to instruct a human. And uh, the basic program would then uh, draw immediate conclusions from a list of premises it had. And those conclusions could either be declarative or imperative. And when they were imperative, the program would take a corresponding action. And uh, one would generally assume that such an advice taker would have a, a wide class of uh, logical consequences available to it. And he would therefore would wanted to say that a program has common sense if it automatically deduces for itself a sufficiently wide class of immediate consequences of anything it's told and what it already knows. Oh, now, um, if you read this paper, you come away with something well, it's, it's sort of an odd paper to read and understand and to summarize. And actually, the guy who reviewed his paper summed it up quite well. He said this about it. McCarthy's paper belongs in the journal of half-baked ideas. Now, this is the same McCarthy that wrote the brilliant list paper, though. So what's going on here? And that's what I call the McCarthy conundrum. Because one half of his work is pretty vague. It's uh, incoherent in places, inter internally contradictory here and there, and on the one hand also incredibly obvious, because of course we would like a program that can do everything. Duh. But then on the other half, we have papers like the Lisp paper, which are incredibly clear, concise, elegant, and groundbreaking. Now what's going on there? Well, my theory is that this is classic left brain, right brain, Uh, classic left brain, right brain strategic intuition, where uh, McCarthy, in his creative process, would first start by sort of just setting all the filters wide open and letting all IDs come in, no matter whether they're good or not, as long as he was making sure that whatever sort of the right ID was, that it was in there too. And uh, then after that, he would go and churn and churn and churn over the problem until you get to a flash of insight. And after that flash of insight, then you can evaluate everything, eliminate distractions, and simplify things to their core. So let's, let's take a look. Is that sort of what happened? Well, if you look, he published Programs with Common Sense in 1959. And then for 18 months, he worked his ass off together with Marvin Minsky to simplify and simplify and simplify this until he sort of stumbled across Alonzo Church's Lambda Calculus. And he added a way to make that recursively reference himself. And in that way, from programs with common sense, we came to the list paper. And I like this part. 
It's especially relevant in the context of this talk because it says part one. But there actually isn't a part two yet. Now, after that, 40 years go by. And in those 40 years, two important things happened. The first thing was that McCarthy went to a presentation of some symposium, and there was a talk there called Programming Languages of the Year 2000. And what McCarthy saw there it sort of pissed him off. He was like, no, this is not the programming language of the year 2000. We should be more ambitious about this stuff. We can do a lot more. And uh, in those 40 years, something else that happened was that McCarthy started reading a lot of books by this guy, John Searle. Now, John Searle is a philosopher, but it's a philosopher who's very interesting for us programmers because he basically describes how we use language to create the part of the world that's in our heads, how we use words and sentences to create laws, customs, institutions, and how we generally make the social world. Now, <laughs> I always like to imagine that just as happened to me, McCarthy was reading that book and had his eyes inexplicably drawn to this part, where you can see that Searle uses parentheses to describe nested concepts referring to each other to explain how we build our social world. Now, uh, to be fair, this book didn't exist yet when McCarthy read it, but, um, but either way, that probably inspired him. And McCarthy, in his old age, decided to get himself worked up one more time and deliver this, Elephant 2000, a programming language based on speech acts. Now, um, let's take a look at what that says, because it should be uh, fascinating, right? This is McCarthy's vision for the future of computing. So he starts off by saying that sort of one of the key goals was that he wanted to have programming language incorporate more features from natural language. So Elephant 2000 is a programming language which in, uh, whose inputs and outputs are meaningful speech acts in the sense of those philosophers such as, for example, requests, questions, answers, offers, acceptances, permissions, assertions, and commitments. Now, a correct elephant program would properly perform the speech act it makes. So when it answers, it's a truthful and responsive answer, and when it makes a promise, it keeps it. Now, uh, to be able to express these conditions, then you would require a formal theory of what it means to fulfill a speech act, and once you have that, you would be able to generate intrinsic correctness statements automatically about the program. So sort of a self-proving program. Now, uh, additionally, an elephant program itself would also be a sentence of logic. And it might not need data structures because it can refer directly to past sentences. So interpreted elephant, for example, would actually have a single data structure of all events. And when new events come in, some prolog kind query could match on all old events, and a compiler would then turn it into something like common lisp or C, and in a full translation, the event history could even be removed. And uh, luckily for us, uh, all right, elephant programs could also support both elocutionary speech acts, which define an input-output specification, but also perlocutionary speech acts, which uh, specify actual accomplishments in the world. Uh, elephant programs would do transaction processes and refer to databases in more general ways than just answering queries and making updates. They could, for example, engage in commercial transactions where they query for, identify, and purchase goods, and generally make commitments and accept obligations on behalf of their owners. And Elephant 2000 is on the borderline of AI, but the article emphasizes the elephant usages that do not require AI. So this is basically the Elephant 2000 paper summed up. But actually, like happened to me and a lot of readers, when you read this, it's actually sort of another McCarthyism. The paper is, by itself, it's pretty vague. And actually, a lot of people who read this when it was published sort of assumed that McCarthy has lost this, lost this edge. But we just explored in parallel that we had in the previous paper. So what if we give McCarthy the benefit of the doubt? And what if we assume that this paper is actually another advice taker? What would the flash of insight be this time? So what would the flash of insight be that gets us 
from Elephant 2000 to recursive functions part two. Well, luckily for me, I actually read Searle before I read Elephant 2000, and I came across this page. And here we see John Searle basically arguing that the key thing that differentiates linguistic from pre-linguistic societies is our ability to express a novel statement out loud in a social context. Because of the reason that whatever you say, you cannot unspeak something. So whenever you say something, you sort of create an implicit commitment to having said it sincerely. And I made a little note there, remembering saying, basically, John Searle here is saying that immutability is the key to what makes our social world possible. And I think that's a very interesting parallel. So could it be that this, purely functional data structures by Okasaki, that that's actually the missing key? Because this book was published around the same time that McCarthy wrote Elephant 2000. So McCarthy didn't know about this yet. Now, how would that have worked though? Because what's the relationship between a speech act like John and Friends and purely functional data structures? Well, actually as closure programmers, we have a very natural representation for this speech act. It's this one, conj John onto Friends. That is directly analogous to the speech act John and Friends because the concept of Friends already existed and we just create a new concept called John and Friends, which is exactly the same as we do in code. So could it really be that purely functional data structures is what gets us to recursive functions part two? Let's go over the paper again, so maybe we can find some more clues in there. And actually here, if we say that communication inputs and outputs are in an I.O. language whose sentences are a meaningful speech act, if you look at this in a different way, this is basically describing Oleg Kishilov's work on extensible effects, which is state-of-the-art research in making side effects first-class citizens in functional programming languages. So that's interesting. If you see here that elephant source programs may not need data structures because they can refer to the past, then we're basically talking about the land architecture, the unified log, event sourcing, all by themselves, also state-of-the-art technologies at this moment. And when you look at this section referring to the past, these are the examples that Tom McCarthy gives. Now, I'm not sure if you can read them, but if you go over them, he pretty much describes exactly what Datomic lets us do. So that's pretty cool. So we're probably onto something. But so far, it leads us to the question, so what? Because everything I said, I just said this is stuff we can already do. Well, that's actually everything except for this one, because he says that elephant programs themselves can also be represented as sentences of logic. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think it's easiest for me to show that with a little bit of closure code. So let's say we have this code here, for example, and it calculates commissions for uh, salespeople. So we have a commission function, and for every seal, you get a 10% commission. And you create a thunk, and you compute it, and for 10 euros, you get one euro commission. That's fine. But, okay, something happens, policy changes. Your commission function gets updated to have a base amount. So, we calculate the commission over 10 euros again, and now it's 250. This is all good. But what if we now want to calculate the old value again? We cannot, because the old commission function is actually gone. Closure is half mutable. Now, to be fair, pretty much every other language out there right now is half mutable too, even Haskell. But still, it's half mutable. And according to McCarthy, that shouldn't be like that. So according to McCarthy, what really would make Elephant 2000 tick is whole system immutability. Or, if you prefer a fancier term, fully pure lambda calculi. And I think that is actually the key to this puzzle, and that is what would allow us to take the power of purely functional programming away from using it in all sorts of disjointed applications and into a sort of formally cohesive unified whole. So, and um, well, as we discussed, McCarthy didn't get a chance to name that, 
So I would like to do that, and I think we should call it conversational computing. And it's, I define it as computing using sequences of immutable statements which reference the past. So that's the basic introduction. But say that we have a language like this. What can we do now that we couldn't do before? Well, I'll start off by this. And this is actually the story of how I first or thought of this idea. And I was working for a company called uh, Growth Analyzer. And Growth Analyzer is a product that tracks children uh, with growth deficiencies, so children who are either too small or too tall. And uh, these doctors, they need to administer them, administer them drugs and things, but it has to be very precise, because if you give a kid like this a little bit too much or a little bit too little, they can go end up like 120, 1 meter 20 or 2 meter 20, neither of which is good. So uh, when every visit, these doctors, they measure everything about these kids. They measure the length of their knees, the length of their thighs, everything, and they measure hormone levels and et cetera. But there was a problem. This used to span 18 years. Now in the course of 18 years, medical science would always advance quite dramatically. Like some measurements would become obsolete, some new tests would be added, so these forms kept changing. But the thing was that after the form changed, all the old forms would no longer be accessible. And that was really problematic because they wanted to be able to view everything in history. And um, well I was assigned to build that, and then I sort of dug down first. Well, you need, for a system like this, you need validations and all those sorts of things, and it's basically code. So I said, okay, we need to store that. And then I thought, oh wait, I need a system where code is data. Well, that's how I fell down the rabbit hole of Lisp. But because this spans so much time, you cannot just keep copying the data. So then I figured out this Lisp would actually need to be purely functional. And that's how I fell out in the second rabbit hole. And if you combine those two together, this system is actually possible because you can create these interfaces and you can use your old code to visualize all your old data. And that's a really powerful thing. But that's not everything. Because once you have a system like this, another thing that happens is that it becomes really easy, for example, to create an alternate version for an A-B test. Because any function anywhere in the system, you can just put a second version next to it, switch half the traffic over to it, and then test the performance ag against some business metric. So you, it becomes an order of magnitude easier and more powerful. Additionally, when you think about deployments, what is a deployment actually other than an alternate version, a test? So an entire deployment, you can also structure it as an A-B test. And if you want to take this one step further, you could even take an entire deployment, couple it to some sort of business metric, and then have multi-arm bandit automatically determine if your performance actually or if your deployment actually improves business performance for whatever reason. And if it doesn't, just roll it back automatically. So that's really cool. Uh, and another thing that would happen with a system like this is that because you have all the data, you can drill down into a full playback of user experience. And it doesn't matter whether that's an hour ago, one year ago, or 10 years ago. From the moment you started using a conversational computing language, you can always view whatever happened back then. Now that's going to be really dramatic for experimentation and for research. <laughs> but uh, that's not all, because uh, I just said, OK, we can view a single user going through your system. But there's no reason to look at just a single user. You can actually decide to look at all the users going through your system. And you can start querying them to, for example, identify all the users that are stuck in a plateau or that are doing something inefficiently, et cetera. And then you can design an experiment, an intervention targeted at those specific users. And you can run this experiment as an A-B test, verify if it's successful. And if it is, then you can integrate it so that as soon as you detect such a pattern, you give them this intervention. Now, is if you start doing this a lot more, you get into what I call conversational interfaces. Now, conversational interfaces are interfaces that react to you using them. And that can be things such as uh, giving a user an explanation when he first reaches a part of the system, which is what onboarding systems already do a lot these days. 
But it can also be, for example, detecting satisfies things. So when a user does something with five clicks that he could do in one, you can sort of detect that immediately and pop up and say, hey, this could also be done with, I don't know, command A or whatever it is. Now, uh, for most UIs, that will be enough. But say, for example, you're a big company with thousands of customer support agents and they need to do uh, work very efficiently. You can even actually detect such suboptimal use. And whenever you detect it, you can just rewind your application and force your users to use your application in the most efficient way. <coughs> so uh, this sort of whole thing of <laughs> making your UI adapt to the user that's using it, well, that's what I call conversational interfaces. And generally, it sort of can get into the point where you use historical patterns to op create optimized interfaces for users. Um, and I don't know if anybody else uh, has heard this term conversational interfaces somewhere else lately, but it's actually very interesting. So there's also a new trend among VC investments, whatever, to call all those apps that you have now where you text with some service, to call them conversational interfaces. So first of all, I was like, ah, damn it, why did they take my name? <laughs> Until actually, I realized that like, what is a text message other than an optimized interface created especially designed for your historical pattern. So an actually really good example of a conversational interface would be where you would say you start a chat with some user and we see that this user usually just places an order. He doesn't want to talk to support but usually he would place an order and then the user would select something. He could record a video saying, um, I want uh, this toothbrush, please. And then the system could respond with, a, once again, a custom designed UI, the usual one or more. And you could, for example, do things where, like, say, I now drop off and I, I don't know, don't do anything anymore. After some time, the system could, for example, show a message like, hey, do you want, still want some? You have 15 more minutes for same day delivery. Or I could just continue and say, okay, more, I want, no, I want five. They're on the way. Now, this is actually the kind of stuff I want to build with my startup Interactly. Uh, we're currently sort of dormant, but we're pivoting into applications like this. So if anybody knows anybody who would want something like this, hit me up. We would love to work on it. And uh, with this approach in mind, I actually want to change the definition of conversational computing a bit and turn it into computing using sequences of immutable statements which reference the past and using these historical statements to adapt system behavior. <coughs> so this is all very interesting, but these are all the functionalities that we enable for the user. But how would such a system work and what would the non-functionals of such a uh, solution be? Well, for that, to figure that out, let's take a look at how you would actually code an application. In a conversational computing approach, uh, you would start out by, let's say, Liz writing two functions. Um, then on top of that, okay, say, okay, Liz wrote her functions. Mike would come along, create a different function, um, create another function that references Liz. Then uh, John would make a function that references that of Liz and Mike and Alice would sort of tie it all together. And this way, uh, you would create a, what is it, an abstract syntax tree. Although in conversational computing, it's actually not a tree, it's a graph, because you could also have uh, future or past versions of your app reference subtrees, or other apps altogether reference subroutines of your app. But let's keep it simple for now and say that we have this abstract syntax graph. And then conversational coding generally is creating an abstract syntax graph with node-level code ownership and a distributed version control built in. And uh, this is really cool, although if you talk to small talkers, they will say they had this back in the 80s already. But yeah, then it wasn't fully pure, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, then we have an app built. Now, how do we get this app to the user? Well, you would sort of, well, like big companies would remove all this developer information. Open source systems wouldn't do that. But the end user would probably get a reference to the root node of the app. But the app could be pretty big. It could be huge. And uh, the user doesn't need all this data. So uh, the user would basically get just the data needed to render, for example, the login page. 
<coughs> and he would do the same for the database. For example, fetch the required translation strings to show the login page. But uh, he would get only the data he needs. And then after, ah, okay. Um, and one key thing to already notice here is that this data is all entirely immutable. So when you cache this stuff, the cache is actually not ever invalidated. At most, you can sort of choose to forget it because you run out of space. And that means that whatever was shared can always be remembered. So if you have all the data at some point, the code and the data to render something, that means you can view it again. So for example, when you have your um, public transport navigation app, if you had the data to render your route or to search for your route, you can always have the data again. So that will really be a dramatic change for offline apps. <coughs> Okay, so then we go on and we uh, submit our login information and then we would render the UI. And when we render the UI, we go off and fetch the rest of the app. Now then we click around some more and we get to some form, we fetch some more data from the database and etc. And like this, you go back and forth. Now this back and forth is actually uh, very important here because that is the conversational aspect of conversational computing. But how it's it's yeah it's can be difficult to figure out how to think about that, and what I've found is that the best way to think about it is in terms of transparent actors, and a transparent actor is an actor that interacts with sequentially, but whose actions you can predict, barring certain synchronization or branching points. So in this case, um, initially, the for the actor of the app only login was transparent to us because that's the only thing we had access to and that's what we could predict. And after we submitted our login details, then we received the code for the other steps and then the actor became fully transparent to us so that we could predict what the next step would be. And there's actually a very interesting parallel there between natural conversation because we speed up natural conversation too by understanding the person we're speaking with, which is very interesting. Okay, so that's uh, how you go in the back and forth. But so far we've only viewed data, uh, viewed stuff, but we also want to create data. So uh, in a conversational language, you would basically just create the data. And when you've done that, you would just send it off to the database where your data becomes part of the database. And a conversational database would basically have this data, this provenance data for every piece of information <coughs> so that a conversational database just becomes a repository of speech acts from users and developers with built-in provenance tracking. Ah, uh, that's where it's from. So basically you know for every piece of data whose data it is. Now that doesn't sound like too big of a deal but uh, I think it actually is because for me it's the ultimate monopoly buster. Uh, people sometimes ask, like, oh, what should we do in Europe to beat Silicon Valley? And then the answer is usually, oh, we should have more VCs, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't buy that because Europe as a culture is not set up for these huge monopoly breakaway successes. Europe is actually good at breaking down monopolies. And if you had a law that would require companies to give users back all their data in this format, then you could get to the situation where, for example, Facebook could do something horrible and in the span of a single day, all Facebook users in Europe could decide to click the button, take out their data, take it to the competitor, and then Facebook could be gone in a day. Okay, but we're not there yet with, in terms of non-functionals. Something more we can do is that here we have these identities. We have an app, a user, and a DB. Now what would happen if we gave them keys? And uh, we told them, okay, use this key to sign all the data you create. If you do that, you get what I call conversational authenticity, where speech acts have verified identities, which if you couple them with a sort of verification and revocation infrastructure, would be the perfect foundation for digital self-governance because you can have a secure and perfect referendum set up in a matter of hours. So that would be pretty amazing. But there's one problem because all this data right now still needs to go across the internet, otherwise known as NSA-friendly territory. 
But is there anything we can do about that? Well, yes, there is. Because what if instead of signing the data, you choose to encrypt your data? And then you take that encryption key and encrypt it against the public key of your recipient. That way you can send the data across the internet and only they would be able to decrypt it. And that's basically how the OTR protocol works, for example. So using that, you would even get conversational privacy, which is an NSA-proof computing paradigm in which our everyday concept of privacy would be embedded into cryptographic reality. Now, this is all pretty, well, out there. And they usually say, like, OK, when you're the only person doing something, you're probably doing something wrong. So uh, let's look at what the state of the art in this field is at the moment. Uh, McCarthy actually predicted that these would be the languages for the year 2015. And it turns out that he wasn't too far off. Is the first thing uh, you can do, of course, we discussed it a bit before already, you have uh, big data, the Lambda architecture, and a unified log, and event sourcing. So you could even already roll most of this your own at this moment. Um, the, if you do that, you would have the concept of an event log as an immutable sequence of statements. And historical code, you could, for example, store in Git. It would, however, not be runnable. So the whole thing of visualizing old data or reprocessing old data would basically become manual work. You'd have to sort of rewrite, always write the code to interpret or process old data. Uh, something like this can adapt to the history of user interaction, though, so it's sort of some interesting halfway land. But it's not real conversational computing. Um, on September 19, 2013, though, Paul, Uni uh, Paul Chusano launched Unison. Now, Unison actually is exactly what we've been describing. Unison is a typed, fully pure lambda calculus. And it does some other cool stuff on top. So its abstract syntax tree is actually a content addressable Merkle tree, which means that uh, every part of the tree is hashed, and you can identify and retrieve that content by that hash. It also has a very nice embedded distributed computation model where instead of having to download the code behind the hash and uh, execute it locally, you can just take your arguments, send it to the other server, and get back a remotely memoized function application. Now, because that all wasn't ambitious enough yet for Paul Chisano, he's also building a semantic editor with Pareto style type correctness, which means that in unison it's impossible to create incorrectly typed code. So. That's interesting, but, well, it's not really closure. However, on June 18, 2013, Reed McKenzie launched Oxlang. Now, Oxlang is an experiment aimed at building a simpler, static Lisp in a spirit like that of closure. It's mostly typed, mostly pure, sufficiently well specified for both static and dynamic implementations, and it's built on the foundations of the statically optimizing Oxcart compiler. <coughs> Now, the statically optimizing Octcard compi compiler was uh, McKenzie's work at sort of trying to optimize Clojure more and more and more. And while doing that, he realized that he ran into one really big problem, which is that functions can change. And that if only he had immutable namespaces, then he could inline and optimize functions incredibly aggressively, because you can, always, you can know that the function you're inlining will not change. So you can basically just specialize it however you want. And uh, so from that limitation sprang Oxcart, which has immutable namespaces and is a conversational computing language. So that's pretty cool. But I recently discovered that there's actually even one more. And that's this one, Eve, by Chris Granger and Jamie Brandon from none other than Lighttable fame. Now, it turns out that although it's not yet a formal pure lambda calculus, Eve is actually also built on a fully immutable log, which stores both the code and the data. And in contrast with all the others, this one has an excellent and already usable IDE, which is remarkably conversational because you input queries and then add data by uh, replying, adding additional responses. So this is really interesting, and you can already check this out today. So I think in conclusion, it turns out that at least I'm not the only crazy person. And with that, I would like to close off this talk, conversational computing, or 
how McCarthy discovered the foundations for the first and second half of computing's first century. So uh, thank you for this, a very interesting uh, work. I had sort of two tangibly related thoughts. When you talk about sort of prefetching in a conversational way the, the code that's needed to run the next steps, the CPU actually already does this on various levels with prefetching and branch prediction. Mm -hmm. And when you think about sort of fetching code over the network then, as you do in the sort of the NSA friendly territory, this is actually one of the thoughts that has been uh, described with the Plan 9 architecture operating system over the P9 protocol. So I was wondering at what sort of level in the, in the architecture do you envision this conversational computing as, as a real programming language or also on the operating system level or even the hardware level? I, I haven't thought about hardware level yet. Could be interesting. Uh, but yeah, definitely this would uh, or would or ideally should grow to encapsulate the OS. I think you uh, would start at the, the smallest level possible. That's actually what we're sort of trying to do with my startup, where basically we just store the interaction path and the rest is still not conversational because that's what's feasible today. But I envision that like slowly, uh, bit by bit, this will uh, extend into entire VMs and then entire operating systems. And also, for example, like there's no need for this to be over HTTP. You could also do this over Tor and then you can get sort of uh, pseudonymity as well. So. I do imagine it really need reaching down. I haven't considered the link with Plan 9 yet. But let's we'll also look at that. Um, it's basically three questions in one. Thanks a lot first. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. first of all, how do you think one could avoid the Turing tar pit in such a system uh, where everything's possible but nothing is easy? Um, I think it actually... Uh, well, actually because, for example, if you represent number types in the in, in, in lambda calculus, right? You can't do that. You have to do um, church encoding and things like that. Yeah, okay. It doesn't need to be a strict lambda calculus. It's uh, it's a lambda calculus in the sense that Lisp is a lambda calculus or Haskell, and uh, you would, for practicality, you would have types uh, or the number types, etc. In the previous version of this talk, I gave, and then also asked about what happened if you want to change to a new version with different types. It's like I don't know that yet, but I think it's actually, for me, this talk is more about the discovery that th I think this is a, a very powerful underlying formalism than necessarily that we already know how to implement that. Right, and um, how do you think um, this formalism wouldn't, like, to me it feels like this formalism would immediately become um, Turing complete and you can't decide shit anymore, right? Because like th that's like one of the problems with all these languages, for example, if, which is based on data log, not uh, lambda calculus, right? Um, in data log, like a lot of data log is basically what we can compute efficiently in, in logic, but once you go beyond that, things start to get undecidable. And even equivalence in data log, for example, is completely undecidable for programs, right? If I take two if programs or two if functions, I can't say anymore if they're doing the same thing, right? Yeah, and I think it's not an, an escape out of that part of the tar pit. You can still get yourself in there, so it's not a panacea, panacea, however you call it in that regard. Um, but you, yeah, you should view it basically uh, just as a lisp, but you have this incredibly powerful feature where your code never changes. Your code always stays accessible. And you do pay some penalties because then, for example, refactoring becomes much more difficult. But if you're interested, Paul Chusano actually explores this in some more depth in a blog he writes about Unison. So that could be a good place to sort of start, like, how would this actually work and what kind of things do you get when you work like this? Yeah, thanks. Mm, yeah, get there. All the prediction that's going on nowadays, I, mm. mean, I really hate it. Because when I go somewhere in, uh, say, YouTube, next day I'm confronted with the choice I made. I get a lot of stuff that I wanted to see then, mm -hmm. but I am not interested in it now. So the whole uh, idea of this predicting uh, my behavior and influencing influencing my behavior past, 
based on my past is something that narrows me down. Even in the music library, I can have suggestions which make me go to one cul-de-sac, which I will never leave again. Yeah. What, what's your thought about that? I think I'll answer that equally philosophically. Or <laughs> um, I think it's basically, uh, and that's I think for me also the beauty about this thing, it's just like life. Uh, it has the exact same dynamics of life, and not more, but also not less. So also in life, you cannot escape the fact that people will get to know you and will adapt to you. But also, like in life, you can manage this by, for example, creating what I already mentioned, pseudonymity, because there is no need for you to stick to your one official persona. It's very easy to you for you to create a temporary persona, and then the things you interact with under that persona stay there. So in that sense, it's, it's just like life. Hi, thanks for an interesting talk, yes. Um, it's also maybe talking about local maxima in somehow there, but um, I'm just thinking about the unikernel stuff that's happening as well, because that's kind of making GitHub kind of executable. Um, so mm -hmm. if you want to execute stuff, you can kind of compile, run, and respond already today, pretty much immediately. Yeah. It jumped off again. Yeah, I th and I think there's actually a very interesting link there. The big difference is that uh, it's not practical for the unikernels and the way how they work to spin up all historical versions at the same time because you really get into resource problems and it's exactly the exact same resource problems that uh, purely functional uh, data structures address in terms of data storage. So it actually there the, the parallel is almost direct where uh, what you're describing is basically the solution to storing all data by just cloning every object all the time, which works, but it's not sufficiently resource intensive. And this is the alternative where you instead reuse all shared structure so that you can make this computationally feasible. I can also repeat the question. Yeah, 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 I'll repeat it in the mic so we have a first. Uh, yes, yes, I think that's a correct understanding and the interesting part here is uh, basically the same answer there is that uh, a discovery like this would make it more computationally feasible to do this at a bigger scale. But yeah, it's a correct understanding. Okay. That's all? Yeah. Thank you then. <laughs>